Right. All right, good morning. It's Senate Health and Welfare, and it is April 15th, Friday, which is a good day for everyone. Uh, good morning. This morning, we're going to be looking at H728. Uh, we have some uh, testimony from the Department of Health and the Howard Center, and then we're going to move right into markup on the bill. So uh, we're interested in hearing what folks have to say. And so welcome. And I I don't know if you have your testimony coordinated uh, amongst the three of you, or if you would just simply like to go in order. Okay, the second, the latter. Okay. Thanks so, Madam Chair. That sounds great. Okay, good. And then uh, I don't have anything from you in um, your written testimony, but if you have something that you can send right into Aaron, that would be helpful. I know I have received a communication from Kelly Dougherty uh, previously. I have your red line and your comments on the sections, but I, if that's what you want to send us, that's fine. So we'll go ahead then. So I have first on the agenda is uh, Grace Keller. Bless you. Thank you. Um, Grace, thanks for being here. Why don't you introduce yourself for the record and then we'll listen to your testimony. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Grace Keller. I'm the program coordinator at Howard Center Safe Recovery Program. Um, it's in Burlington. It's Vermont's oldest and largest syringe service program. So we have about 5,000 lifetime members, and we're located at the top of Church Street in Burlington. We're the only full-time syringe service program in Vermont, so we actually are statewide. We do have people that come from every county in the state, and um, typically as, as high as 30 to 33% of our clients come from outside of Chittenden County. Um, I've been there for 14 years. I've done, done a lot of the work. I've done case management and case management supervision. And currently I oversee the low barrier buprenorphine program, which is um, immediate access to treatment and the syringe service program. So feel free to ask me questions about any of that. Um, I am here today. Uh, I guess what I, what we're all, we all know is, is happening, but I can give a frontline perspective um, on the overdose crisis in Vermont right now. Um, we are losing clients at a rate that we've never seen, especially in my 14 years. Um, I, as harm reduction, we work with people who unconditionally, so whether they're using or not, whether they're in long longer term recovery, whether they've had relapse, and that gives you the privilege to stay in people's lives um, for the lifespan. So we know a lot of the, the, our clients um, very closely. We know their family members and their friends. So when we lose and their and their goals and their and their dreams and their children. So when we lose one of our clients, um, it's really devastating to all of us. And we often think about what we can do differently and um, what systems we need in place to really help in the front lines. I can give you an example of last week, we found out early morning on Tuesday that we lost a client of ours, um, a young woman who was under 40 um, in the morning and it was devastating to all of us. We all knew her really well. Um, and had been working with her for many years. And then hours later, we had an overdose event at our office outside of somebody in a car that staff had to respond to. So our front lines are really, um, our frontline workers are really struggling, are really um, uh, dealing with a lot of trauma. And we're really terrified to continue to lose our clients and their family members. That person in particular had three children. So we also really um, always think about children who are losing access to their parents. Um, and when we talk about prevention, I think the best thing we can be doing for kids is, is keeping their parents alive and, and giving them access to treatment. So um, I did look, and I'm sure Kelly will talk about this too, the, the new statistics coming out of the Department of Health um, for 2021. Um, there's a 33% increase in fatal overdoses. Um, so they were 158, we're now at 210. Um, and one of the statistics that really jumped out to me, and, and feel free to stop me if you have questions or if I'm um, talking about things. No, that you no, need. Grace, Grace, the only question I have for you is, will you be sending your testimony in writing? I, I haven't, but I can, for sure. I can pull it together. I think that's really important. You have data here that helps us understand the issues. So thank for you. For sure. Okay. For sure. I can do that. 
Um, so the, the, one of the statistics that stood out to me the most was that 93% of the overdoses were fentanyl involved and only 10% were heroin involved. So I think that speaks to what Kelly and I and, and everybody knows is that we're really dealing with a fentanyl market, not a heroin market any longer. And that has very serious consequences for overdose, um, for, uh, for treatment and for access for people and for people who aren't using opioids but are using other substances that may be um, combined with fentanyl um, accidentally. And um, when also the other alarming statistic is that 30%, 30 percent, um, 30 less or 19 percent were under the age of 30, and 40 percent were under the age of 48. 48 uh, percent were under the age of 40. So we're also losing people at, at a very young age. And we had a speaker at Howard Center last week at our conference that was talking about how you know we have we have a lot of. Um, different interventions in the world that are working very well uh, to prevent overdose. And in the United States, our front lines don't have access to a lot of those uh, interventions like overdose prevention sites. And he was talking, one thing that caught my mind from his, his speech was about how there's a cost to the steep learning curve. And in, in, in this country and in Vermont, we've had a steep learning curve with a lot of the interventions that could be really helpful right now. Um, and as somebody who has I, I, I oversees the program and has to go and tell each and every one of my staff um, when we've lost a client, you know, almost every time all we're talking about is the system and how we feel like our hands are tied and how we feel like um, we wish we could have done something differently. So I, I do want to talk about the people that we're losing and their family members. And I also want to talk about Vermonters who are dedicating their life to this work and really trying to figure out how we can, can move forward in ways that, um, that other communities have, that other communities are employing. Um, I also can talk a little bit about um, a couple pieces of this bill that, that, um, that involve harm reduction. We're talking about the, um, the, the report and, um, and the expansion of the paraphernalia piece. So the paraphernalia piece is, is one that I brought up in the, in the house. Um, it's really simply an updating of language that is just making, making something more um, codified. The paraphernalia exemption right now exists for syringes, um, but really should exist for all the supplies that we provide um, because we haven't really had anybody charged in many years for that, but we really want to just make sure that the, the, um, the language is up to date. So we hand out many different supplies to people and, um, and we want to make sure that they're protected for having any supplies that they would get from a syringe service program. Um, you know which section of the bill that is, we'll find it, but I, I know it's there. It's, uh, no, I actually don't have it on me right it's okay. now. It's okay. <laughs> yep. Um, the That's other right. piece that, that, that will come up, I think, for Kelly, too, is the piece around um, an, a report about syringe service programs. And, and I've talked to our um, grant folks in the health department and our other SSPs. Um, one of the things that I worry about with, with a report right now is that we really are um, strapped for resources. And we really have been working um, we're seeing an increase in our clients. We're seeing an increase in new clients. We're seeing an increase in overdose. And we have done reports that are very similar to that uh, not so long ago. I think, you know, with COVID, our, our timeframes are really hard to, to remember exactly. But I believe it was with Jolinda. We did a report four years ago where it took us, you know, six months. We all sat down. And with syringe exchange, the best practices have been established for so long that I feel like you're going to get a very, very similar report. Um, and it'll take a lot of effort. So I, I hate to to try and push something or, or, or remove something. But I do think that that's, um, I think it was looking for progress and I don't know that that's what we'll get from that report. I think we'll get very similar report than we would have had four years ago. So, um, so Grace, a question for you then, uh, rather than a report, it might, it might be helpful because I've been thinking about this as well. And I know I've, I've seen some of the comments from the Department of Health about this that rather than a report perhaps a presentation the two committees so that we could just see where we are mm -hmm. i think that's going to become important going forward as 
some of the opioid settlement dollars also come into the state. Absolutely. Okay. I, think that, I think that would be better. Um, or, okay. um, and, and I think most of our syringe service programs have testified. So you could also, you know, call us, but there are well-established um, best practices that we all follow. We, we all work very closely together and with the Department of Health. So I think for those, those things, it's, it, you know, it's, it's sort of something that we've all been doing for a long time um, and, and are, are, um, are really rooted in the best practices nationally. I think there's another question from yep. Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Grace, for your testimony. I, I think you may have just answered my question, but maybe you could expand on it. And that was the, um, about best practices. You said they're well established and you're all using them. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we need to do in this bill to make sure that we are codifying or underscoring the best practices so that the, the statutes have your back for doing what you need to do? I think that um, that I appreciate that question. I think um, the main thing is really updating the paraphernalia um, piece. I think that that's really, you know, we ha like I said, we haven't heard of anybody getting charged, but we want people to get access. And and it, and there could come a time where somebody could get charged with, you know, carrying some of the other products we provide. So I think um, even even stuff like sterile water isn't included. So I think just updating that. Um, okay. I think as far as what we need um, as, on the front lines, I think I've talked before about safe um, consumption sites or overdose prevention sites. You know, I know that they're one prong in, in an approach. I've been to Vancouver. I've toured their sites there. Um, I do know that we have lost people who have talked to us about having nowhere to go and no one to to be there when they use. And I think we're losing a lot of Vermonters because they're using alone, um, especially at times of relapse. Those are times that are more dangerous and more stigmatized. So I think really we should be looking at that, um, especially since there are two sites in New York City that are open and operating. Our, our neighbors in Canada have been doing it for many years. There are a hundred in the world and they've never had a fatal overdose. And I think if we had statistics like that for a cancer intervention, we would be um, employing it a long time ago. And I think we really need to look at that. I do, do appreciate there's a report in here. Um, I think probably coming from the front lines, I would rather be looking at um, immunity and funding for a, a overdose prevention site, especially because I think the federal government is going to hopefully um, make a statement here soon. Um, so I would rather see that. But um, if we are going to do a report, my concern is about how long the date is is out. The date is out till um, 20, November of 2023, and that's a really long time, especially at the rate we're losing clients. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Grace, thank you for saying that. Um, I, I have, you know, way more than I do, but based on what I've read, I've also seen a lot of evidence that safe consumption sites are effective. Um, mm -hmm. I have heard, though, that they are a little difficult to set up in rural areas just because of the uh, numbers of people, et cetera. But you're in Burlington. You're on the front lines in Burlington. Are you, is, are, would you be able to, not you personally maybe, but <laughs> the community be able to handle, manage? Are you ready if we, I mean, I'm thinking of pilot or something um, in Burlington. Is there the capacity there to do that? I believe there's the capacity. I think what Howard Center would like to see is um, uh, immunity provision, um, if, if possible, right. and funding. Um, Safe Recovery has struggled for funding for many years. Um, we are Vermont's largest naloxone distribution site. We've distributed about 35,000 doses out of our office. In 2020, we were 56% um, of the naloxone distribution and we're one of 85 programs. So I think, and, and when we look at the overdoses, we've done heat mapping in Burlington. They are centralized around and near our office. Um, and so, and, and same with like um, discarded syringes, all of those things are improved by having a safe, a safe consumption site or an overdose prevention site. Also, we know that people who utilize those are more likely to enter treatment, just like um, people who utilize syringe exchange are five times more likely to enter treatment. And we have treatment on demand at our office. We're one of the first programs in the country to have an embedded 
um, low barrier buprenorphine access treatment at our office. So people get treatment the same day, oftentimes the, within the same hour or two hours when they request treatment, because we really wanted to be there for that captive moment. Oh, oh, okay. so it would be a similar, a similar thing. And, and I know it's not the cure-all. I know that, you know, there are issues, um, but there are safe, unsafe injection sites all over the place right now. Um, and we, we've lost long-term clients. I had a client that I knew for many years that, that died alone in the intervale. Um, and he was really struggling. He'd been in recovery for many years and her, injured his back and was struggling with pain. And so we really, um, and we do know that people, we, we surveyed our clients actually, and 91% of them said they would use it. Um, you know, and, and really, I think having a, a safer option with people who can intervene when there are um, concerns or overdoses or um, people want support or mental health crisis. Like, I think that that really makes sense. And I think it's pretty clear to the rest of the world, it makes sense. And I think it's time to really start um, looking at that. Um, for our clients, I, I also know a lot of our, our clients, loved ones who would really, who've spoken out about this, who've lost, um, who've lost family members. And for our staff, um, it, you know, you can't, being a leader in this, in this field, you can, I can't describe how it feels to talk to my staff after we've had an overdose at our office, after we've lost a client and, and know that we all know what could have helped or could have changed that. And, um, and, and maybe not always this would be the answer, but I think that's what we have to look at is pulling as many of these interventions together um, to, and being able to pivot. That's one of the things with our drug laws in this country. We can't pivot very quickly, especially with the changing drug market. Like I was talking about the poisoning of our drug market with fentanyl. Um, we see those results and, and we have such a good relationship with our client population that we can really gather data and move in real time, but we often have our hands tied. Um, and the, and this, the secondary or, or primary trauma that our staff is suffering too is something that we should be looking at. Um, Thank you, Grace. Thank you so much. This is very helpful. And if we could get something from you in writing, that would be terrific. Certainly. So, yeah, I'm going to suggest that we move on uh, and hear from Kelly and Andrea. And and but don't go away, please. If you have the time to stay connected, okay. I, I do. Thank you for having me. And I also I can give you my contact information if you need anything. But thank you so much for having me today. Oh, it's good to see you. Thank you for being here. All right, so um, we have two folks from, uh, one from AHS, Andrea and Kelly. Is there a preference for who goes first on this one? No, okay. Oh, I'm gonna you look go at Andrea? Some... Go right ahead, Kelly. Okay. Who, who wanted to go first, right? I, I, did, I, did, I didn't know who said that. <laughs> I'm happy to go first. Terrific, okay. okay. And we don't have anything from you, but I think if you can send something to Aaron, sure. if, you, if you send it now, he'll post it and then the committee can follow along. I don't have anything written down right now, but I can certainly summarize and send it um, in short order after we're, we're done. Here. Okay, well, I'll tell you why, because we're going to go right into markup on the bill. Yeah. We finish uh, hearing from you two and then uh, three. And then, uh, so whatever we have, we have. Um, I did get, I did get a red line on the bill. Was that from Andrea? No, that was from me. And I believe you also got some notes um, that go yeah. through section by section. So um, can, you, can you send that in to Aaron? I sure can. Yep. Do that if, if, as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe we should let Andrea begin. That's fine accomplish that. Okay, Andrea, up to you. Thank you for being okay. here. All right. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Actually, not afternoon at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long morning. <laughs> good morning, Madam Chair. It's nice to see everyone. Uh, for the record, my name is Andrea Delabriere. I am the Commissioner for the Department of Vermont Health Access. Fairly new, in fact. Um, and I'm here today just to speak to the amendment portion of H-728, which was added by Health and uh, House Human Services last month, I believe. Um, we worked in close collaboration with them. This was an important aspect of the bill. It did not initially include Medicaid. 
and the general term health insurer did not include Medicaid in the bill and we were added um, and subsequent conversations resulted in the amendment that you have um, in this bill. <clears throat> Essentially, from our perspective, nothing in here is any different than we would do otherwise. We're comfortable with how it is. We don't, we never thought it was necessary, I'll say that, but it is something that's very important to the committee and um, you know it does only result in an additional report for us so um, essentially we're the prior authorization aspect of this bill is <clears throat> what was in question and whether or not to remove that and um, you'll notice in here that we are still according to our preferred drug list that is essentially decided upon by our drug utilization review board as well in consultation with our clinical utilization review board, we do offer one medication in each therapeutic class for MAT, um, for methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Um, and as you know, our hub and spoke models here in Vermont are very, uh, very successful and um, we have consulted them as well and they at the time did not feel there needed to be any changes in the prior authorization process um, from a clinical perspective as well as a fiscal perspective on our side. Um, any changes at this point in time would result in a loss financially anyway of $4.2 million in rebates that we receive from pharmaceutical companies that we contract with. So I'll stop there. Um, if there are any questions you might have that I can answer. I'm looking, uh, do you have the specific uh, section where the amendment was added? Um, section four. Okay, yeah. Page okay. seven. Page seven. Okay, good. This is helpful to us. And you are supportive of this amendment. This We're program. comfortable with it, as I, as uh, I mentioned, Madam uh, Chair. That, yeah, we'd rather not have it at all, obviously. <laughs> But we're okay. we're it doesn't change anything that we're doing. Okay. Um, it's things that we would do as best practice anyway. I just want to make that clear. But we're comfortable as it is, and I know that it's important from the um, human services committee. Yeah, say no, thank you. You know, frequently we know that you folks are doing things um, that represent best practice, and it, our goal is to stay connected uh with what's going on so that that this is very helpful and they were they were very collaborative and we, we arrived at this together so i feel we feel very comfortable with how it is if it needs to stay oh, in the bill terrific thank you this is great and welcome to eva thank and you it's an exciting a, time <laughs> yeah this is the first time you've been in our committee it has uh, so yes terrific we look forward to working with you likewise and thank you so much all right so questions for Andrea. Uh, thank you. And we'll, so we'll just, we'll scoot over to Kelly and Kelly. Um, we have your documents up on our webpage now. So if our if committee members, if you just want to refresh, uh, you'll be able to, whoops, they're not, not refresh again. <laughs> Keep refreshing. Oh, Did you? Oh, there they are. Good. Thank you. I'll use a little refreshment. Perfect. All right. So, Kelly, thank you for being here. And uh, thank um, Why don't you just go right ahead with your testimony? Great. Um, and for the record, my name is Kelly Doherty. I'm Deputy uh, Commissioner at the Vermont Department of Health. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee, for having me here this morning. Um, I want to uh, just take a moment and thank Grace for her, you know, sharing sort of the frontline perspective of this crisis that we are dealing with in Vermont. Um, it's really disheartening uh, to see our overdoses increase. And obviously here at the health department, we want to do everything possible to address this crisis. Uh, there is very little in this bill that I think will make an impact on our overdose rates. Um, and I will go ahead and explain why. Um, so a lot of what's in this bill is duplicative of work that is already being done. 
um, when, if we go section by section, um, the section on uh, community-based needle exchange and expanding the entities who are eligible to uh, act as a syringe service program is really unnecessary. We do have syringe service programs across the state, including mobile exchanges. Um, and Vermont Cares is actually also a full-time uh, syringe service program. And all of the syringe service programs in the state do provide peer-based services. Having them be um, an aid service organization or a healthcare provider uh, ensures that certain standards are met um, and expanding the eligibility criteria for uh, becoming a syringe service program um, is really unnecessary because they already provide peer-based services, which I believe was the intent of that section. Can I ask a question as we go through, I think one of the sort of the overarching question will be, uh, are, have these programs been um, legislatively authorized? Are they in statute or are these things that have happened organically? Um, I don't know the answer to whether they're in statute, but the Department of Health has standards and criteria for these programs. Sure, I well, know we appreciate that. Uh, but we're we're very supportive of the work that you folks are doing, and very appreciative. But uh, uh, just trying to understand where whether they're whether they're on if they're ongoing, then are they supported by statute? So frequently we'll see programs that are in place, but if they're not supported by statute, then they they may just wind down and disappear. So our goal here, as we're looking at legislation, is to ensure that the good work that you're doing uh, is maintained. So we'll we'll try to compromise on some language that doesn't um, take it completely out, but might say, please continue the work um, and uh, expand this to the extent practicable, something like that. So what is just definitions? Yeah. So I don't understand. I know. That. Okay. Just definitions. <laughs> okay. So go ahead, Kelly, that, that just some thoughts that you might think about as we're going ahead. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to address the, um, the overdose prevention site working group portion of the bill. Um, okay. There is already a group in Burlington and down in Windsor, Wyndham counties. There's also a group exploring uh, the feasibility of overdose prevention sites. So, uh, you know, I don't, think that establishing another group yet, you know, to study this issue would really accomplish anything. And um, because that work is already happening, and I think it would divert resources from the Department of Health to convene yet another group to explore that option. Um, section nine, which speaks to funding a mobile a pilot mobile MAT program. The Howard Center actually uh, is has funding of their own federal funding uh, to pilot a mobile MAT program. So I don't think, you know, and we're poised to sort of evaluate how that works and um, pursue it if it seems effective. So I don't think funding an additional pilot is really necessary uh, in this bill. Um, That's good. Uh, good. So thank you. No, uh, yeah. so anything in this bill that isn't already being done? Where was where we're finding out? We're finding out. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. okay. I feel like okay. I, I think I think I, that the issue well, for us. Sites are not being done. Yeah. The not so the the know. issue the issue for us is if there is something going on and it is. It is something that we would like to hear about, maybe a presentation back or some integration of the work that's going on across the state would be helpful for us to understand. So it's not about saying it's for, for me, it's not about saying, oh, it's already happening, which is great. <laughs> and it, it federal funds are in place, but it is um, what can we learn from it and how can it inform uh, 
the legislature going forward. So, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's a place to, to meet on this one. Um, and then um, I'd like to speak to section 10, which is the funding for justice involved yes. individuals. Um, uh, the Department of Health and the Department of Corrections um, work very closely together. And uh, the Department of Corrections already provides treatment for incarcerated individuals through their existing healthcare contractor. And the health department and DOC work closely on coordinating services for people upon their release from incarceration and also on recovery for people, uh, recovery services for people within the facilities as well as when they transition out into the community. Um, people who are justice involved in the community have access to services just like anyone else through ADAP's preferred provider network for treatment and also for recovery services through the 12 recovery centers in the state. Um, we would certainly support um, additional training for recovery centers and treatment providers on how best to serve people who are involved with the justice system. But we feel that segregating people um, and providing separate services uh, can be very stigmatizing. And so, you know, we're already serving this population through our existing system. Um, and we actually have resources already to provide training should that be uh, necessary. So um, we would propose eliminating that section of the bill. Okay, thank you. And I know mm -hmm. that um, I in particular have worked with folks, uh, both in DOC, BDH, AHS generally on this issue and very sensitive to the needs. And I, I appreciate your comments about stigma associated with people um, leaving and transitioning out of corrections. So thank you. Okay. Go ahead. And then finally, um, the section 11, the pilot program for emergency overdose response support. Um, we are already funding projects um, in uh, several counties, Washington, Rutland, Windsor, and Bennington, which are um, some of the ones that are, have been hardest hit which connect local law enforcement to recovery coaches to intervene with individuals um, and engage them in uh, connecting to services. So our plan is to expand this program statewide uh, with existing federal funding. So we don't think it's necessary to fund that through this bill. Okay, um, that, that's, that's good news. That saves some state money. Right. Um, and yes. But it would be helpful to at least hear back what's happening. Go ahead. Yeah. And um, you know, Madam Chair, you've uh, you know, I want to thank you for your ongoing support for prevention services in many areas, and we're very concerned about the funding being diverted from the governor's proposed prevention initiatives. Uh, to fund portions of this bill. So we would really advocate for um, looking at those prevention dollars and restoring uh, those funds for prevention services. Well, you just did. You just <laughs> <laughs> no decision has been made by the committee. No, it's not done yet. But, no, thank you for those comments. I think this committee is very much committed to uh, prevention overall, then we don't have the need for all of these intervention and treatment services that you are have put in place. And we we honestly very much appreciate the work that Grace you are doing and, and Commissioner Dower Dowerty that you are doing. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions uh, for um, Commissioner Dowerty. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Commissioner, um, you just proposed eliminating $880,000, I think, doing my math quickly, but so um, saying you already have the funding for all of this and you're already doing all of this, but we're seeing a crisis out in the field and are your efforts just not working or, or what, 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 what are we, what are you doing that, 
what should we be doing that will work better? People are dying. We heard this testimony already today. And you're just saying, let's eliminate all of this stuff. Well, I'm not saying eliminate it. A lot of it is already happening is what I'm saying. So it's not necessary to put it into this bill. Um, you know, we have a pretty robust um, overdose prevention overdose prevention initiatives. Grace talked about naloxone. We are distributing naloxone all over the state. We are um, promoting it through um, an overdose awareness campaign, you know, letting people know that's targeted toward people who are using substances as well as their family members and friends, trying to get the word out about the prevalence of fentanyl in the community. Um, we're working with our syringe service programs like Grace's to um, do additional outreach to people in the community who, you know, maybe aren't coming through the doors um, so that people are aware of the services that they provide, as well as the availability of naloxone and fentanyl test strips. Um, unfortunately, this is something that is happening across the country. Um, it's like Grace said, the prevalence of fentanyl and the drug supply has increased dramatically. Like Grace said, 93% of our overdoses last year involved fentanyl. Um, and it's an extremely powerful uh, substance that is also being found um, in counterfeit prescription pills. Um, so uh, we're really trying to get the word out to people that services are available, fentanyl test strips are available, naloxone is available, and treatment is available. We're very fortunate in Vermont to have um, a treatment system that is available when people need it. So that is not the case in many states. So um, yes, we are in a crisis, but um, the Department of Health has really been, um, and Vermont has really been at the forefront of trying to address this crisis. Um, and so uh, if you have additional thoughts on things, you know, and another thing I'll say is, you know, we're in communication with our regional and national partners, you know, other states. So we're always hearing about what other states are trying and what they're doing. So we're, you know, we're doing everything that we, um, that we can. Um, and, uh, you know, so unfortunately- well, it, sounds like, it sounds like we're not doing the safe- um, Right. Section site. So what if we put this $880,000 into a pilot of a safe, safe injection site or whatever it's called. Safe. Uh, you had a safe consumption site um, is the term Kelly used. Mm -hmm. Would the department support that? I mean, it, it's it, we we you just freed up a whole bunch of money for us to do that. Right. I mean, I think that that's your decision, and we are certainly in support of anything that can help address this crisis. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Let's do it. Okay. Any other questions for the commissioner or for Grace? Yes, Just Senator a question Hooker. for uh, Commissioner Doherty. Do you work with groups like Grace's, and you know what kind of coordination is there? And you know, if you're doing all of these things, it just seems kind of counterintuitive that if you're doing them, that there would be this bill that sort of suggests that it needs to be done. So, I mean, how how much coordination is there? Um, between the department and the groups that are out there fighting the fight on the ground. Yeah, we, we work closely with uh, the syringe service programs across the state, as well as treatment providers and recovery centers. And so is the question of, you know, that there just needs to be more. There needs to be more activity, more, more help from the department for these you know, I'm going to let Grace speak to that because she's on the ground and she can speak to the support that uh, that they get from the health department as well as um, from other entities. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what I can say is uh, for safe recovery, we the, um, there is money that went through the house uh, because we the sunset, the uh, tobacco settlement fund sunsetted. So we were we are looking to restore that and and add some funding this year because we are our mobile um, treatment program that um, 
that Commissioner Darty um, was talking about is funded for the actual treatment, but there is a federal ban on funding to syringe service programs. So for the actual product, we need we needed some additional funding for that. But we do work closely with the health department, um, I, and and we are coordinated with all the other syringe service programs. One of the other things I can speak to, I don't know that I, I comprehensively answered the question you asked before about Burlington and and poised to do a um, overdose prevention site or safe consumption site. Um, She's right in that we do already have a um, a group established. I'm the I'm one of the co-chairs of the overdose prevention site group that's part of well that came out of the Comstat group in Burlington, and we all have been working closely. The city um, law enforcement, local law enforcement. There's a, a a group of us that's been working on this. We actually did a report, I believe, in 2017. Again, with COVID, my my time frame from that time period is really hard to remember. With with Sarah George. Um, where we were all on the same page and supportive. And I think Howard Center, we've long talked about, how, you know, we explored, we went up to um, Vancouver. We've done a lot of exploration and study on this. Um, we are uh, um, poised to do that. It's just really that what we would need is funding and we would, and, and we'd really look instead of having a, um, another report and committee, just like um, Kelly said, I think we would really prefer to look at having an actual um, immunity statute and funding in this bill and, and move away from a report that's um, in 2023. I think there's a very decent chance that there's going to be a green light from the federal government or at least some um, indication from them on May 15th. And I think a lot of communities are going to be able to move forward. And I think we should set ourselves up and, and maybe it doesn't mean that we have to do it, but it means that we can. And um, and I do think that that we are probably the, the the site that everybody's seemed to look at. We just really need to be supported by the community and, and funding. So, um, so what, I'm, what I'm hearing then is if we do see the green light from the federal government and possible funding, then we should have something in place that makes that happen. And I'm so I'm thinking that I'm not, I don't know which section of the bill we're talking about right now, but we, I, I think that's language that would be, we would be able to put in um, and then it would be ready to go. So, yep. I, yeah. I would yeah. think at a minimum, we need a immunity for community-based providers um, right. and and um, like landlords or landholders and those kind of, those kind of things. Okay. I think that's what anybody would look for. Uh, two more questions, one from Senator Terenzini and then one from Senator Cummings. Uh, thank you, Senator Lance. Um, can somebody give me a really quick description of what a safe injection site looks like? In other words, what, what do I what, what do I do there? How do I, you know, just I, I can't envision what it is. Sure. Um, do you want, which one of us do you want? We, either I don't one. care. <laughs> I think Whatever. either one of us could do it. Um, I'll, I'll give it a try. And then, um, so uh, in, in, there are about a hundred of these in the world and they look differently depending on different communities, but they basically are, um, and, and, and actually for some places they've been doing it for so long that they have very different um, uh, iterations of it that, that can react and respond to certain communities. They can throw something up in a very short period of time if they're seeing a large outbreak. Um, but there are uh, places where people can go bring their drugs and use um, with other, um, oftentimes medical staff, but um, professional staff um, or peer staff. And if an overdose occurs, there are people there to respond. Um, there are people there to uh, administer uh, life-saving services in Narcan, and there are people there to call 911. Also, usually, and what we would have is, is wraparound services. So um, syringe service programs, uh, access to treatment, access to support groups, um, you know, really a, a case management and counseling, really a one-stop place where people can go. Um, and I know it probably sounds counterintuitive at some points to, to talk about this, but what we do have in Vermont is a place uh, that a lot of people are dying because they're using alone. Um, and a lot of people are using in their cars and um, in, in remote places. 85% of our clients have experienced homelessness. So when we talk about like rural access, you know, for our clients, a, a lot of them have, are really located close to us, are homeless, have nowhere to go, have nowhere to be. 
Um, and if they have a safe place to be, we can also really work on giving them other services. We also can um, just support them in a way that um, that they don't have right now. And, uh, and oftentimes you hear about people that are terrified uh, to die. Our, our clients, so for the majority of the time up to 2017, 23 to 26% of our clients had witnessed an overdose. We, we asked them on intake. Um, and in one year in 2018, that number jumped up to 81%. Our clients have almost all witnessed an overdose. 57% of them have overdosed themselves, probably higher than that now. Um, and people are really afraid they don't want to die. And we really, this, this, this is what 91% of them said they would use. So that's really where it comes from. Um, is that a better great. description? That's good. Great. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Senator Cummings had a question. No, I, I remember doing this with yes. Sarah George. Yeah. What happened? I mean, where is that bill, where did it get? Because we can't do legal immunity. That has to go through judiciary. Yeah. I know yeah. that's something that we're trying right. to avoid. Uh, there's a report in Kelly's thing. Yeah. There's a, a, a link to the report. Yeah. The yeah, but we we're, we can't do immunity. Right. This is a big time. But I'm just trying to figure out where the roadblock was. I can it speak to that a bit. Four years ago. I, I can speak to that a bit. Um, at the time, um, the, the so the it, it's illegal on the federal level currently, um, just like marijuana is. And at the time, um, Christina Nolan, who was our U.S. attorney, um, made a statement that um, no matter how well-meaning we are, um, that any program that were to start this would be subject to arrest and asset forfeiture. Um, and so that is uh, really what I think stalled a lot of this for programs like ours. Um, and I think that that was the stance, not just of her, but of all of the U.S. attorneys. But New York has since opened one with no consequence, and they have to respond to a lawsuit from Philadelphia by the 15th of May. And everybody's sort of anticipating that either they're going to um, stay out of the way or, or remain silent on it or, or hopefully move forward in endorsing it. But that, that federal barrier should, it will probably be removed um, very soon here. Um, it, so that's- Senator Carazzini has a question. So just a point of clarification for you on the screen and my colleagues, I'm getting a little bit confused. So we do not have any of these sites currently. No. Okay. Number two, where, Katie, I'm reading through this bill. Do you know where in this bill it talks about it? We'll, we'll yeah, get to there's we'll, a we'll group. Yeah. And um, the overdose prevention sites. I think it's section eight, so my mouse isn't working. So I'm guessing. We'll 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 have Katie come up. We're gonna go through the bill and do some markup on it. Okay. Any questions then for the commissioner or for Grace? This has been extremely helpful one last thing yes yeah I know right this, this opinion might not be popular amongst everyone but uh that's okay <laughs> that's your job that's my job <laughs> but, so, I know. So, 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 to Commissioner Doherty's point you know you sort of asked you know if you had ideas what else we could do I think that we have um I think that we have a tremendous law enforcement shortage right now in the state like we do with nursing and teachers and other things. I think police agencies are so strapped for people right now that we should all collectively be supporting recruiting and hiring police officers so they can find the drug dealers bringing the fentanyl into our community. I'm not suggesting the users. I'm suggesting these high level dealers that we just saw in Bennington last week that they, they did a drug bust and found 500 bags of fentanyl in Bennington. So we need, you know, boots on the ground in terms of law enforcement retention or recruitment as well to help fight this, this drug battle. Oh, if we were only the Judiciary Committee. <laughs> or go Can I ask one more quick Please, yeah. Yeah. Um, Grace, I think you mentioned um, expansion of the drug paraphernalia um, definition. I was just exchanging notes with our legal counsel on this one. Um, are you, do you have the bill by any, by any chance in front yeah. of you? Yes. Section one in the definition section, it, there is a definition for drug paraphernalia and mm -hmm. there is a, there's a slight addition to it. You yes. know, does not include syringes or other harm reduction supplies. 
Um, right. Is that sufficient expansion or were you looking for more? Um, no, that I think is sufficient. Let me read it again. Um, Yep, that I believe that is sufficient. Um, I mean, my preference would just say it's just leave it at harm reduction supplies, period, and not say distributor possessed and really decriminalize all of these objects, whether they people what all of these tools, whether people got them from a syringe service program or, or not. Um, I think that we should really not be looking at, at criminalizing any of um, things that keep people safer. Uh, but if, but if it has to stay as distributed as part of an organized community-based needle exchange program, it's still an improvement. Okay. Um, I just think it's kind of, an, it's antiquated and it's, it's not used, but it could be, and it, it would be good to just bring it up to date. Okay. That's, that's helpful. And then the specific, um, we're also trying to get information about this, but the immunity provisions that if we were, I know we're not the judiciary committee, I realize that, but, um, but if we were it, immunity for basically staff who would work at a safe um, consumption site, is that what you mean? So that you couldn't be prosecuted for assisting someone who's there. Yep. I would say staff, I would say agencies, and I would say um, either landholders or rent holder, you know, um, you know, cause we, at some point you're gonna, you may run into a landlord or somebody that you wanna rent from in an ideal spot. So I would, I'd really try and hold harmless anybody who's involved trying to make this happen. Got it. Thank you. And I'm happy yeah. to go talk to judiciary. If I, I actually have, I think four or five years ago, testified in, in their committee. Yes, you did. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, so thank you all so much. Thank you. This has been very helpful, I think, for all of us. And uh, any other questions? So we're good. Thank you. I think what we're going to do, uh, we're going to take us, we're going to have Katie come up. And Katie, I think the first thing is I'd like to look at the short amendment that you have to 711. And then we'll move right straight back to 728 and go to Marfa. And <clears throat> Commissioner Doherty and Grace, you're welcome to stay with us. Um, as, as we go through 728, because we will have questions as we um, as we look at the bill together. So, so there's nothing is simple around here. <laughs> no. So let's look at that little amendment. It's okay. under Katie's name, and it says Lions Amendment. Amendment. I'm hoping it'll be it's it's all of us. Seven eleven is a different bill, right? Seven, now. Yes. <laughs> Different bills. Is, is, it, is it up on our website? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's under Katie's name. And that's not working. It's so frustrating. I can't pull it up. Oh, it's your. And then I can do it with a little. It just takes twice as long. The trackpad is. Yeah. Frozen. Yeah. Restart your computer after. You put, do you have it? Not yet. Not yet. I'm getting there. I apologize. So okay, Shirley. Take your time. 7-Eleven is not on today. It's is it Aaron? I look under Katie's name and you'll see. I see the amendment. I'm looking for the full bill. That's not up there. Yeah. Just the, just the amendment. That would be from yesterday. So I can. Uh, the bill will be under bills out of committee or it will be online from yesterday. It was yesterday. Yeah, I got it. So just to refresh your memory while I'm pulling up this amendment for myself. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. I just want to read off mine. Oh, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it was almost perfect timing, but okay. Um, so yesterday you voted out your amendment to H711, and that was the language um, on the opioid settlement. And if you remember, the amendment um, in three places changed a single reference to a type of fund that we would be draw drawing from a national settlement fund and expanded the, the group to um, reflect there might be settlements coming from different entities. And after you voted that out, I get an email at about one o'clock from Josh Diamond at the AG's office saying, actually, um, one of the words, one of the phrases was the National <laughs> Settlement Fund Administrator. Um, and he would like to replace that with National Abatement Account Fund. 
Um, and it occurs in three places because that's we we change the list in three places. So um, it, it makes sense because the other items on the list are like fund or trust. And this talks about a person, an administrator. So instead of referring to the administrator, we're going to be referring to the fund itself. Okay. And it will. So, so is that inclusive of the other trust? all the language that's there does he feel that that's comprehensive yes um and maybe you want to hear from him but quickly when i was on the phone he was going through each of the yeah. titles and saying that's that settlement that's that settlement okay. um so each one has its own term and then there's kind of a catch-all at the end okay. but this term national settlement fund administrator is talking about you know drawing down from the person instead of the funds so the replacement so the would make it from the fund and it would replace it in the three places in the in your amendment, your um, committee report where that was used. Oh, okay. So that that that's what this amendment is. And you know, if any, if the committee would like to support it um, individually, we can't offer a committee amendment. So we, we can't sign this out. Yes, yes. We voted this bill out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, so much yesterday. It's hard to know. No, it's hard to remember. <laughs> Um, so if you want us, if the committee wants to support this, then you could each sign on and it would be then from all of us. Does anybody not want to sign on to it? That's fine. So we should vote on this. Are you the free of reporting? I am, yeah. So any discussion? Thank you, Katie, for following up on that. Tarantini, yes. Hooker, yes. Tomlinson, yes. Hardy, yes. Plans, yes. So I'll just I'll take that up today, and it will be when the bill comes out. I will just a question. Uh, I'll ask John. Oh, if you bring it up now. Yeah, yeah we, I think you'll have to talk to him a bit about the process. And in, in my mind, the way it's working, because it went to is oh. it, it's it with a probes now. Um, so I'm thinking that you know the first the committee report is considered and approved, and then you're amending the right. uh, the, the bill. Right. Um, and we're amending but, the committee report. But we don't know what a post is going to be doing, so that could be an extra layer there. We'll wait. Um, well, I hope they don't change it. We'll see. Okay, I'll I'll deal with that part of it. But that's good. So then, Katie, I think we need everybody's name on it. Yeah, that's good. It would be quick and easy to do if my computer is cooperative, but I'll I'll have to wait till either we start or go back. Okay, yeah, I think we have time. Okay. Okay, so let's move to um, 728. Okay. Um, and we've heard we have the comments from uh, DOH, and we've had some good testimony today. So I'm thinking we should go through the bill. Um, okay. You want to help us? Yes. Okay. <laughs> As I scroll very slowly to the top. Okay. Um, sorry, I don't know if I just have a paper copy. That would be much easier at this point. And I'm looking at the Department of Health comments. Karen, do you have a paper copy of 728? Uh, you want the. Probably. Okay. I'll get it actually. Okay. Sorry. Um, well, we're waiting. I think that you section one. Um, so, section one, it um, does make changes to definitions, existing definitions. In our opioid use disorder, thank you so much. Opioid use disorder um, chapter, and um, their definition of drug paraphernalia. Um, this is the conversation you are having with Grace. Does not include needles, syringes, or other harm reduction supplies with the added distributed or possessed as part of an organized community-based needle exchange program. And then we have the definition of organized uh, community-based needle exchange program. Um, and there is well, like- I just wanna, I just, as we go through, because we've heard testimony on the, this specifically, um, I'm inclined to leave it as it is. What is the 
the other two uh, graces suggested were to end at supplies because then it wouldn't be associated with any distribution by an organized community-based needle exchange program. So, um, what can I ask Katie a question? Oh yeah. Right, but um, what is this definition used for? I mean, these are in here. Um, so these are all carrying. Let's see. Or 75. Um, I'm thinking they were appearing the opioid use disorder chapter of the bill. I'm thinking it might be, I, I have to pull it up. It's underlying statute. You know, well, I know, but you want to know what chapter. Yeah, oh, 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 I'm sorry, this was just so frustrating. Do you want to use my computer? I mean, 18 GSA 4475. Here's the bill. Oh, thank you. Can I, mean, I pull up? Go, um, if you go to this tab, there we go. Yeah, you can go to. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Did you check your um, Wi-Fi connection? It's not the. Um, Can you restart your computer. Sure. Because I need my help. It's a trackpad. <laughs> I can't move the mouse anywhere. Yeah, I did. I have this. Oh. Do you want to take like a five minute break? Let's do that. We're just going to take a five minute break. 